Howdy! Welcome to Elementary Statistics. My name is Lance Curtis. This is the lecture for Section 10.5, Nonlinear Regression. Here in this final section for Chapter 10, where we're talking about regression models, we're going to get into the nonlinear world because as much as we would like the world to be linear, there are many things in the world that just don't conform with that type of model. So we need to learn how to, re how to make regression models with nonlinear forms. There are three basic rules that we need to uh, recognize when we're dealing with nonlinear regression. So we'll start by going over those. We'll look at the generic model types that we run into, that we commonly, most commonly encounter for nonlinear regression. How to apply those model types practically. We'll look at assumptions in StackCrunch. Uh, because we're going to be using StackCrunch to make our models, there's some assumptions that are built into StackCrunch. So we need to know what those assumptions are and how we can handle them so we can get what we need to get for our nonlinear regression. And then we're going to wrap up looking at data transformations. Yes, they've come back to haunt us. But this, this time it's going to be like Casper, the friendly ghost, because the data transformations are actually going to make it easier for us to get the information that we need to answer the questions in our assignments. So let's dig into this and get going. As I mentioned before, not everything in the real world is modeled with a straight line. We would love everything to be linear, but the truth is not everything is. So we need to know how we can model with non-linear regression methodologies. So everything we've looked, up, looked at up till now has dealt with linear relationships. What we're going to do now is look at nonlinear relationships. So the data points are not conforming to a straight line. They conform to some other type of line. Again, because you know it's super calculation intensive to do this stuff by hand, we're just going to use the technology to, to focus on this. And this actually makes sense because the intention here uh, is not to turn you into some expert statistician that can make whatever model you need to make. The purpose of this section is to get you familiar enough with the concept and the methodology of nonlinear regression that you, you're comfortable around it, but you don't necessarily need to be an expert at it. Okay, so what I'm going to introduce you to in this lecture is a simplified way to get through your assignments. Okay, The methodology that's taught in the textbook is what you would need to know and master if you were becoming an expert model maker and taking a job like I had in industry where part of your day job is making statistical models. Well, most of you aren't going to go in that direction. You're not going to end up being someone who makes models as part of your day job. Okay, so I've actually simplified the procedure so that you can go through this, uh, do your assignments for this section and get through it much easier. I'll explain the details of that as we go along. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think this is okay because, again, the intention here is not to make you expert model makers. If you do end up learning more about statistics and doing model making as part of your day job, then you're going to take other coursework along the way that will help you take care of that. You may also do what I did and learn a lot of this, you know, <laughs> by actually doing it. So you end up with a little steeper learning curve doing it that way, but you can get there all the same. So again, I'm going to focus on a simple way to approach your, your assignments for nonlinear regression. You'll still have an understanding of what's going on, but you won't have to go through a lot of the uh, intense methodology that's proposed in your, in your textbook. Now, your textbook author proposes three rules for identifying a good statistical model. The first of these rules is to look for a pattern in the graph. You examine the graph of the plotted points and you compare it to the basic pattern for the generic models that you need to make and then use that comparison to pick out which, uh, which one should, should uh, form the basis of your regression model. 
you're going to find and compare values of r squared. Again, we're looking at the same data set, so there's no need to account for differences in sample size or differences in uh, number of variables uh, for your uh, regression model. So uh, your author is just going to use values for R squared to figure out which one has the better fit. And the last rule he gives is to use common sense. Don't use a model that leads to predicted values known to be totally unrealistic. Now I look at these three basic rules and I think about my experience that I've gained working in industry and I think, yeah, it's mostly right, but, you know, looking back on my experience, I'm going to say, I need to make some minor adjustment to each of these three rules. So first, I'm going to adjust that first rule by saying, yeah, you know what? You do want to look at the pattern in your graph, but, you know, each application for which you're going to make a model has a specific generic type associated with it. So, for example, we're looking at, you know, a particular situation and we're making a model for that particular situation. We tend to use the same generic model type for making nonlinear regression models for that situation. So, because of this fairly consistent use of particular models with particular situations, um, yeah, you want to compare the patterns to make sure it matches up, but you're not really going to select the model that you're using based on that match. You're just going to go with what's commonly used. Second, you're going to find and compare values of adjusted R-squared. Now, I know, that I mean, the author makes sense when he says that, okay, so we have the same sample sizes, and we have the same number of variables, so we can just go ahead and use the R squared value. However, there's still an amount of variation between the different model types because you're using different equation forms to make each of the different models. R squared does not account for that variation, but adjusted R squared can make some accounting for that variation. So yes, you want to use adjusted R squared when you're comparing the values for the different models that you're going to be making. And third, yeah, you want to use common sense, but you also want to use good judgment. You're, when you make a model, before you recommend it for use by other people, you're going to test it out. You're going to try it. You're going to see what predictions does this model make for known data points. And you're going to see, is this value actually realistic? How close are we to the observed value? Of course, you're going to do that little cross-check before you start recommending a model that other people are going to be using. But if that really is your model, you should strive to provide more rigor so that it provides realistic values. So, you know, the, the value may not be completely unrealistic, but it might not be completely realistic. So you're going to want to put more rigor into your model, uh, more, and that, that's more mathematical complication is what that means. Uh, so that you can actually make a better prediction for the values that you know. Sometimes all you can do is all you can do, but you want to use good judgment when you're making your models and make them the best you can possibly make them. Again, in the real world, when you're looking at different model types, that typically you're going to have software that makes the different models for you and then provides your adjusted R-squared values for you to compare with. It's going to provide p-values. It's, it's going to provide you know, the numbers that you need to make the comparison. And then you pick the one that uh, is the best for your particular application. Again, the model with the best numbers is not always the one that wins. Sometimes a model with a slightly lower uh, adjusted R-squared value or a slightly higher p-value is the one that you're going to pick uh, because the model is simpler or the model simply makes better predictions uh, based on the data values that you have. So again, you want to use good judgment and not just pick the ones that have the best numbers with them. Let's look at the generic model types that we'll be looking uh, for models in this section. 
So first, of course, we have the linear model. And the form of the regression model takes uh, the, the form of the equation that you see at the top, y equals a plus bx, where a is your y-intercept and b is your slope. Then we have a quadratic form, which you can see forms what's called a parabola. So this is your, your simple curve shape, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Then we have an exponential model, where, which conforms to the general form y equals a times b raised to the x power. Then there's a power model, where we take the exponential model and we switch the b and the x. So we have a times x raised to the b power. And then we have a logarithmic model, which takes the form y equals a plus b times the natural log of x. These are the five generic model types we'll be looking at in this section. There are other forms your model can take. It may not be just an actual um, you know, line on a graph. The model could actually conform to a statistical distribution. Many of the models that I made in history conform to the Weibull distribution. It's a distribution we haven't looked at, but the Weibull distribution is very useful for the applications that I was using. And it's typically chosen for a lot of engineering applications simply because the Weibull distribution can mimic other distributions. So I can turn the Weibull into a linear model or an exponential model or a power model or a logarithmic model simply by changing the, um, adjusting the different uh, variables within that distribution model. So it's which one is typically used because we can kill many birds with one stone. We won't be looking at that distribution for our purposes in this section. We're only going to look at the five that are listed here. This is enough to give us a flavor for uh, nonlinear regression. Now, as I said earlier, okay, we notice that in specific situations, there are some generic models that tend to be used as the model of choice. And so what I've done is I've tabulated a list of example applications from the practical world and I've tabulated them. So, for example, uh, tobacco smoking deaths are typically modeled with a linear model. Shock waves from explosions are typically modeled with a logarithmic model, so on and so forth. So, you can actually look and say, okay, so what application am I trying to make a model for? Find it here on this table, and then you know what type of model you need to be making. So this is extremely useful because as opposed to doing what uh, your, your textbook author was as suggesting you do, that you, you plot the points on a data a graph and you compare it with the different generic models that you need to make, well, here we don't need to do that. We can actually just say, what, what are we trying to make a model of? Find it here on the table and then look to see, okay, we're going to make this type of model with it. Let's look at an example to illustrate this concept. So here we have data on population growth. So population of the United States in millions for different years. So every 20 years between 1800 and the year 2000. Notice we have what's called coded years. Some of your problems were going to work with coded data. I think it's obnoxious, but it is what it is, so I'll help you get through it as best I can. We're going to work this problem in coded years, because some of your assignments are arranged this way. So notice that the coded years, so instead, you know, instead of the year 1800, instead of putting 1800 into our model, we're going to put 1, because this is the first year of our study. This is the second, 1820 is the second year of our study. 1840 is the third year of our study. So we're going to put these coded years in, and this is what we're going to use to actually make the model with, and not the actual, not the actual year from the calendar, but we're using a coded year. So now we're going to use a mathematical model for the we're going to find a mathematical model for population size and then use that to predict the size of the US population in the year 2020. So what's the next very next data point that comes out from our data set. 
Well, the first step we make we do when making a model is make a scatter plot of the data. So here's our scatter plot of our data. We look at this and we say, oh, well, that doesn't really look like a straight line. That looks like something that's nonlinear. So which nonlinear form are we gonna are we gonna use for our model? Well, there's two ways you can approach this. The first is you can compare the pattern of the data uh, to the scatter plot in the scatter plot with a general shape of generic model type. So if I'm looking at you know different forms for my model from the generic types we looked at previously, I could be looking at saying I could be looking at one half of the quadratic form. So say the right half, it doesn't make I mean the whole data set doesn't make you know this U shape, but the right half of it, I could use just the right half of it and conform it, and that might actually fit this data point here. Or I could be using an exponential model because it's got that kind of curve shape to it too. Or the power model, I could be using that as well. So any one of these three models look to be my best choice. I'm not going to be using logarithmic because remember logarithmic is the exponential kind of flipped over. So it's, the data points are actually going the other way. So I'm not going to use logarithmic. And it doesn't like to be formed to a straight line, so I'm not going to be using linear. So I compare it, and this is the theoretical approach, where I should be able to compare it and say, okay, pick the one from here. But as you can see, how do you distinguish between these three models, the quadratic, the exponential, and the power? How do you know which one of these is the best fit for your data just by looking at the simple comparison? Well, you don't. And that's where the other approach comes in, which is more practical, from, from at least from my vantage point, it seems more practical. You can use that table of practical applications I gave you on the, on the previous slide that you can just say, okay, so what is it we're trying to model here? Look it up in the table, and then that tells you the model type that you should be using. By the way, if you use that table, you're going to find population growth appears as an example of a quadratic model. So... I'm actually going to fit this data point with the quadratic model form. Again, I could, you know, do the comparison straight out. I can, you know, make, make each of these three different models. I can look at adjusted R squared values or R squared values and P values and do the little comparison thing. But I don't need to do that. I have the table of practical applications that tells me, okay, I've got this application, so I'm going to make this model for it. So, yeah, I can go through and do all the work, doing it the way the textbook wants you to do it, or you can just simplify it and do it the way I'm suggesting you do it. Using the practical approach, you'll make just one model, and it'll be the one model that you need to give you the right answers for your assignment. So now we know what model we need to make. Let's just go ahead and use software to make the model. We're not going to get all calculation intensive here. Let's just use StackCrunch to go ahead and make our model. So when we do that, we get a results window that looks like this. So here's our model for the quadratic form. And we've got the parameters, and we've got our ANOVA table, summary of fit. We've even got predicted values here. So we can, make, we can actually make predictions with our model in StackCrunch. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, let's actually look at the model itself. So the regression model is listed up here at the top of our results window. So there's our model. Notice that we have the same coefficients for our model listed here in the parameter estimates table. So again, when I'm putting those individual numbers you know, into my answer field for my, for my assignments, I like to look at that parameter estimates table because it helps me to keep straight with what's what. And then if I wanted to write it out, I could just write it out like this. So y equals 2.7669x squared minus 6.0028x plus 10.0121. This is our regression model. Now we have our model, we can use it to make a prediction. So there's two ways we can go about this. Okay, but remember, we've got coded years for the model. So we have to use coded years when using the model to make a prediction. So the coded year for the year in question, 2020, is 12. So I'm going to put 12 into my regression equation. If I punch this out on my calculator doing this by hand, I get 336.4121. I 
I don't have to calculate it by hand though. I can actually use StatCrunch to make the prediction for me. Okay. Notice that I can actually, in the options window, there's that area for making predictions. If I put the coded value in, the coded year 12, and then, you know, whatever level of confidence I want, in this case it was 95%, I can actually make the same prediction. And notice how the number comes out exactly the same. So, now, the prediction that we're making, okay, it's the same whether you get it by hand or, or with the software, but it's still outside the range of our data set. And earlier, we talked about how you don't want to go too far outside of the range of your data set. You don't want, you want to be careful about extrapolation. Here we're going to say it's okay because we're just beyond. We're at the very next data point. Our data set ended at coded year 11. We're making a prediction on coded year 12. So it's just barely outside the range for our data set. So we should be okay. Now, I wouldn't be making a prediction for coded year 13, 14, 15, so on and so forth, because in my estimation, that's getting far beyond uh, the range of our data set, and we're in well within the range of extrapolation, and, and who knows what your, what your curve's going to do, especially when it's a nonlinear curve that you're using to make the model. It, it could go in any particular direction. It might go up and then down and then up and then down, and you don't know when it's going to go up and when it's going to go down. And that's why you, you want to be careful about extrapolation, especially with nonlinear regression. Now, notice the model that we made was not user-friendly. In order to use the model, you have to have a coded year. Well, who thinks in coded years? That's not user-friendly. You, if you want a user-friendly model, you need to make one to where you put in the actual calendar year. And that's what you use to make the model, because that's what the that's what the end user is going to be thinking in terms of. So we can make a model that uses the calendar year um, instead of the actual coded year. And this would be a more user friendly model. So here's the model for the coded year, and if we remake the model, wow, coded and original that doesn't seem right. I'll have to look at that. Anyway. If we make the model where we're actually, um, <clears throat> oh yeah, so coded years and original years. So this one uses the, this one on the right uses the coded year. This one on the left uses the original year, or I should say the calendar year. So we can actually make predictions with calendar years using this. Notice we get a different model that comes out. So the parameters for each of the models are very different. The coefficients are going to differ. Okay, but the value we get predicted from the model is the same, whether we're using a coded year or 12 or the actual calendar year for 2020. Okay, so our coefficients are different. But down at the bottom, notice we get the same predicted value for y. So we're getting the same response, even though we have different coefficients, because uh, the coefficients are adjusted such that we can actually use a calendar year rather than a coded year. This is a much more user-friendly model because people don't think in coded years, they think in calendar years. So this new model is, in my opinion, a much better model because it's more user-friendly. There's no need to translate your input in, in order to get the model to give you useful information. So when you're making your models, keep this in mind. And, and this, is, this drives me up the wall that, you know, the, the assignments that were given for this particular section continue to have these problems where they're using coded years because it trips students up every time. And I wish they wouldn't do that. I wish they would just be more straightforward with it uh, and use a more user-friendly model. But be that as it may, I use this as an opportunity to teach the students about the need to make a more user-friendly model. Now, I mentioned before that there are assumptions in StackCrunch. So, there are assumptions of StackCrunch that are built into our model, and they affect how we can use StackCrunch when uh, making nonlinear regression models. So, let's talk about these assumptions for a moment. First assumption that's made uh, by whoever designed StackCrunch and put the you know built the code for it, is that 
You're only going to want one model when performing any type of regression on a data set. And it's for this reason that StackCrunch does not offer an automated comparison feature. I've mentioned previously how in the real world, people that use software uh, for model making as part of their day job, they actually have software that gives them, you know, mul that makes multiple models for them. So they can run through the list and see, and then ranks those models, and then you run through the list and say, okay, which one is the one that I'm actually going to use to make my model with? So the assumption is that you're making multiple models, because if you're making models as part of your day job, you want to make multiple models. You don't know which one from the outset is going to be the best. So you want to make multiple models. Why they're assuming in StackCrunch that you only want one model when performing any type of regression is beyond me, because making multiple models and comparing them and, and doing an evaluation to figure out which is the best one is a part of making the best model. So I, I don't understand why this assumption is there, but it's there and we have to deal with it. And I'll show you in a moment how we can do that. Two, the assumption is that you know exactly what model you want to make. Okay, so the assignments that you're going to be given, the problems in your assignments are presented under a different assumption which is that you're going to make a model for each generic type and then you're going to compare those to see which is the best one. Well, StackCrunch doesn't have an automated model comparison feature, so you're going to end up making models one at a time if you're doing it the way that your author suggests you do it. If you do it the way I suggest you do it, I'm going to give you a simpler way to get around it. So, yeah, we're going to deal with this, this assumption as well. Third assumption built into StackCrunch is that your needs for nonlinear regression will be few and far between. They're assuming that when you're making a regression model, it's you know pretty much going to be a straight line. And there is a there is a, a polynomial function in there for you know for higher order functions of second order, third order, fourth order, and so on and so forth. But you know nonlinear regression, I mean looking for an exponential model or a power model or a logarithmic model. I mean, those needs are going to be few and far between. So, you know, we don't have separate options in StackCrunch for these different models. And that's why you don't see them there because it's assumed that you're, you're hardly ever going to need them. Well, that doesn't really conform with your assignments because you're being asked again and again and again and again to make these nonlinear regression models. So the way you need the way you can use StackCrunch to do this, okay, because who you know the designers of StackCrunch said that your mod, that your needs for nonlinear regression are going to be few and far between, what they did is they actually programmed data transformation capabilities into the options window for your for your linear model and so with that you actually have the ability to make uh, you know all those different nonlinear forms but you have to transform the data in order to get the right coefficients for your model this is really obnoxious and you're gonna see this uh, the work I have a workaround for this assumption um, you're gonna think it's a little obnoxious but it's a lot easier than trying to do it some other way um, and it because it's the only way you can use StackCrunch to get the answers you need you just kind of have to suck it up so I try to make it as easy as I can make it uh, by putting everything into it into a table which I'll show you here in a moment and it's, it's one you're going to want to use uh, when you're actually running through your assignments because it makes everything a lot easier but these assumptions in StackCrunch, on the face of it, make it look like everything's going to be really difficult. So I actually looked for that way to make uh, everything much more simple for us to use StackCrunch. Here's how we're going to do it. So we can't actually change the assumptions that are built into the code of the software, but we can actually um, develop some workarounds so that we can work with those assumptions. If we could read a problem statement from our assignments and know precisely what model we need to make, we could easily handle the first two assumptions. So doing it the way the textbook wants you to do it, 
You can make each model individually, but again, what needful principle we're going to learn from that? The, the intention here is to give you exposure to nonlinear regression so that you're comfortable with it, not to make you an expert model maker. So I don't see any need to go through that. I suggest you just use the table of practical examples I showed you earlier to identify which model you need to make. So you've got a problem statement. You look at, say, what is it that we're trying to model? What's the situation here? Find that example application there on the, on the table and then read across and say, okay, I'm going to make this type of model. And then you just know this is the model I'm going to make. There's a third assumption there that's not covered by that practical assumption table. So we need a simplified way to use nonlinear capabilities in StackCrunch without excess complication. And the way I've simplified everything is by making another table that tells you what you what buttons you need to press and what you need to do with your results. And that's the information that you really need to know to solve your problem. So I made another table to guide you through each step of that process. I'm going to show you that table here in a moment, and then I'm going to show you how to use that table to solve an actual problem. Here's the table I'm just talking about. I'm calling it the data transformations table because for some of these nonlinear regression models, we need to do some data transformation. So notice the different columns for the table. So here I've got on the left, I've got the different models that I could be making. I've got the general form for those models. This is helpful when you're looking for the coefficients to put into your assignment, those little fields into your assignments. This general form tells you which coefficient goes with which, uh, which position in the general form. So you put the right number in the right place. Now, here the next column tells you the, the regression option from the menu options that you need to select when using StackCrunch. So for most, for most of your uh, regression problems, you're going to be using the simple linear regression option. So you go to stat, regression, and then simple linear. Notice that for the quadratic model, you have an exception. You're actually going to be using the polynomial menu option. So for a quadratic model, you want to select polynomial. For everything else, you want to select simple linear. Then when you get to your options window, notice I have another column here that tells you what you need to do in that data transformation section. So you're going to have drop-down menus for your X variable and your Y variable. So if you're making a simple linear model, we're just going to leave these as the default setting of none. That's just the way we've always been doing. And then in the results window, we just take our intercept and slope straight off our results window. When you're making one of these nonlinear models, however, notice how you've got at least one of those drop-down menus that you have to change. So we're going to be using the natural logarithm, ln, is the abbreviation for natural logarithm. That's a mathematical shorthand there. So we're going to be using uh, natural logarithms to make our data transformations. Notice you don't have to go through the math to figure out which one to do. So if I'm making, for example, a logarithmic model, I know in, that, in my options window, I want to go to that data transformation section. And in the drop down for the X, I want to select the natural log of x. I don't want to do anything with the y. I want to leave that alone, so I'm going to leave that as none. And then in the results window, when it comes out, I'm going to take the intercept value as my a, and I'm going to put that here in the general form. And then the slope, I'm going to take that, that's my b, and I'm going to put that here for the logarithm for, for, for the general form for my logarithmic. And then that's going to give me the solution that I need to put in to get the answer to my assignment. So using this table, it's actually very simple. Once you know what model you need to make, this tells you what buttons you need to press in StackCrunch to get the answer and what you need to do with those answers because some of those answers you're going to need to transform. Notice if you have an exponential model or power model, there's some slight calculation you need to make in order to get the right number to put in for your assignments. But that's easy enough to do. 
the table here tells you what number to take and what to do with it. So for linear quadratic and logarithmic models, just use the coefficients as they appear in your parameters table. But when you have an exponential or power model, you need to do some data transformation. Okay, I'm going to go through the math behind uh, the, that tells you what you need to do. You don't need to do this every time you get the model out because it's there in the table. But I'd like you to have a little bit of an understanding of where those, um, where those instructions are coming from. So let's do a little bit of the math so we know why it is that we're doing what we're doing. Looking at the exponential model, here's the general form, y equals a b times b to the x power. So if I take the natural log of each side of my equation, the, the properties of logarithms allow me to separate the a and the b to the x power. I can add, I can add them together as you see here. And then another property of logarithm says I can take that x as my exponent and put it out in front of my logarithm. So now I've got the natural log of y equals the natural log of a plus x times the natural log of b. Notice that what I have here in this form is very similar in construction to the general form for a straight line, the model for the linear equation. So Notice that the intercept, b0, is the same as the natural log of a. Well, that means I can set those two terms equal to each other. And then I can solve for a, because a is what I want to get. a is the number that I want to get to put into my general form. That's the number I'm going to put in for my assignment when I go to do it. So that's the number I want to get. So I'm going to set b not equal to the natural log of a, and I'm going to solve for a. And b not is simply the intercept value. So the, in your results table, the in the parameters table, that number for the intercept, that's, that's your b not. Now I'm going to solve for a by taking both sides and saying, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to take e, which is the base for your natural logarithm, and I'm going to raise to each side of my equation. So now I can use the property of logarithms that says when I take e and raise it to the natural log of a number, the result is that number. So now I've solved for a. So now I have to take my intercept value and raise e to that power. So if I use the table, and this is the value that you see listed in the table, it makes it easy. I just take the intercept value from the parameters table, and I just raise e to that power, and that gives me my, my value for a. I can do the same thing with my slope. Notice the slope for my general form, b1, is the same as the natural log of b. This is just some number that I'm multiplying by x, so that's going to be the same as my slope. So I can do the same procedure that I did before, so setting the slope equal to the natural log of b and solving for b, I get e raised to the power of the slope is equal to b. So I'm going to do the same thing here that I did for a. Take my slope value and, and solve for b. If I'm looking at a power equation, I can go through the same process, right? Where I take the natural log of both sides, separate everything out, and get the same general form as that equation for a straight line. So then I can compare and say, okay, so now b0 is going to be equal to the natural log of a, which we saw before, actually comes out the same way. Take e to the intercept power, that's going to be my a. So I'm just going to use the table like I did before. Here I've got something a little bit different for my slope, because the x is actually inside the natural logarithm. So the comparable value for my slope is actually the coefficient out in front. So now I'm going to set b1 equal to b. And there's no further manipulation to do here. The slope is the number that I want to take. So here I'm just going to take the slope value straight off the results window and use that for b. So now I've explained a little bit of the math behind why we need to do some data transformation for the results of those two models only. 
Uh, let's look at a practical example. And I'm going to show you how to apply the table that I constructed to solve these pro particular problems. Here we've got uh, a problem about bacteria growth. So in a carefully controlled experiment, bacteria are allowed to grow for a week. The number of bacteria recorded at the end of each day, and we see that in the table there at the bottom of the screen. We're now asked three questions. First, what does a scatter plot of the data look like? Two, what mathematical model best fits the given data? And three, how many bacteria can we expect to see on day eight at the 5% significance level? So let's go through, answer these questions one at a time. First, we're going to look at the model table to know what model we're going to make. I know it said that we wanted to do a, a scatter plot of the data. And if you want, you can go through and do a scatter plot of the data. But remember that when you do that regression in Stack Crunch, you get two pages to your results window. The first page is your results, the numerical results, and then the second page is the actual scatter plot. So I'm just going to go and say, just skip down to the second question first and say, okay, which model are we going to make first? Go ahead and make that model, and then I can just flip to that second page of my results to look at my scatter plot. So here's the example applications table that we saw earlier. And I'm going to ask myself, okay, so what, what, are, we, what are we trying to model here? So this is a, a question about bacteria growth. So I'm going to look into my example applications. I'm going to go through and find where do I see bacteria growth. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to look through it, see if you can find it. Should not take you long to find it. If you, if you see it's right here. If you haven't found it already, bacteria growth. So now that we see that conforms with an exponential model. So now I know I need to make an exponential model. I don't need to make all these five different types of models. I know exactly which one I need to make, and I can just go make that model directly. I know I'm going to make an exponential model. So now we need to prepare to make our model. So once we're in, we've got the data in stat crunch, we're going to do a stat regression, simple linear. Why are we going to simple linear? Well, because in the data transformation table, you see here I've got a cropped view of it showing only the model that we need. So we're making an exponential model. It says I go to simple linear. That's the regression option that I need to make that model. So that's where I'm going to go. Now, when the options window comes up, Notice I'm going to put my data here at the top, select my columns, and I'm going to put in my desired data transformation. So the columns I select, that tells them where my data is. So X for X, Y for Y. And then I'm going to go down to the bottom and see where it says transformation, this area right here. That's where I'm going to take this, this information from my data transformation table. So notice the X says none, so I'm going, to, I'm going to leave that alone for the X. But then Y says natural log of Y. So I'm going to, I'm going to select this drop-down menu, flip it down so I put in says natural logarithm for Y. So now I've got the options that I need to, to go ahead and make my model. But there's one thing more that I need to do, and that is I need to check the box for use original units and graph. It's right there at the bottom of that transformation section. Make sure this box is checked. I'll explain why in a moment why you want this box checked. It, it'll make a big difference. Once you've got all that done, go ahead and press compute and you're going to get your results window. Then, as I said previously, you just go to the second page to get your scatter plot and you're going to see whether or not the regression line fits the data. But what you see on that scatter plot depends on whether or not you check that little box. Let me show you what happens when you, when you do or do not have the box checked. Your scatter plot is going to give you the data that you provide. But whether it provides the raw data or the transformed data depends on whether or not you check that box. So if you check the box, you get transformed data. And that's what you want, because notice that your line of best fit conforms to the general type for the model that you're trying to make. Here, in this case, it's the exponential form. 
if you don't check that box, what you end up with is untransformed data. And since the menu option we're using in StackCrunch is for a simple linear model, untransformed data gives you, well, a linear a linear model. You get you get a line of best fit that's a straight line. Now you can still look at this and say, yeah, you know, the line here it tends to fit these data points pretty well. So yeah, the model fits it very well. Same as you can here. The difference is that you're not looking at transformed data. You're looking at untransformed data. When you're making a model, especially one that's nonlinear, you want to see a model that you want to see the graphical representation of the model you, you you're trying to make. So make sure you check that box. That way you're going to see the true pattern of your data points and not the um not the not the not the uh untransformed data, the raw data. That's not that's not, it's not going to give you the pattern that you want cuz here the pattern looks like a straight line, but that's not the real pattern. The pattern is is that it keeps going up and up and up ever increasing with the same increment increase in time. So make sure you have that little box checked before you go ahead and press compute. Now we're ready to make our model. In fact, the model's already been made if we were looking at the scatter plot that way. Just flip back to that first page of your results window and you can get the parameters that you need to put into your equation. Let me explain how this is done, okay? The results window is listing in the general form for a straight line. What we need is a general form for an exponential model. Notice the two equations are very different. This is where that data transformation table comes in handy once again. So going back to that actual line and looking at the results window here on the end, this tells me what I need to do with my numbers so I get the coefficients I need to put in to the problems that I'm solving for my assignments. So follow these instructions and to get the right coefficients. So here, in order to get my a and my b, that's what I need for my general form, I have to take the intercept and the slope values that I see here in my, in my parameters table, and I'm going to use them as exponents on the natural logarithm base for e. So a is going to be e raised to the intercept power. So the intercept power, Notice the intercept values right here for my parameter estimates table. So I'm going to take that number and substitute it in for the intercept. That gives me e raised to the 2.64 power, which when I punch out on my calculator gives me 14.06. I'm going to do the same thing to get my b value, only this time I'm going to use the slope because that's the, that's what, that's the instruction I'm given here in my data transformation table. So I take the slope value, I'm going to substitute that in here in my equation, and I'm going to get e to the 0.637 power, which when I punch out on my calculator gives me 1.89. So our general form for exponential model is y equals a times b to the x. So this means I'm going to put 14.06 in for a and 1.89 in for b. That gives me 14.06 times 1.89 raised to the x power. This then is the regression equation. Notice it is not 2.64 times 0.64 raised to the x power. And it's not 2.64 plus 0.64x. Okay, you have to keep in mind the general form and that's why I listed it here in the data transformation table. So we could be reminded this is the form that we want to use and this tells us how to get the numbers to put into that form so that we get the right answer out when working problems in our assignments. Now the last question we were asked was one about making a prediction and StackCrunch makes this easy. Okay, Once you've got the model made you can easily make predictions. So if you go back to your options window and go to the prediction area that you see down here, it's just above the area for, tra for data transformations. So put in the, the X value that they give you, put in the appropriate confidence level, make sure that you're using the same units. 
Okay, sometimes the problems try to confuse you uh, by being a little inconsistent with the units. Uh, and if you have coded years or coded anything, make sure you're using the coded anything to put the prediction in. Uh, but make sure that you put the right number in to get the right number out. And then, you know, here we're actually for a prediction on day eight. So we're going to put eight in for the model because that's, I mean, there's no coded anything here. It's just straight number of days. So on day eight, we're going to make a prediction at the 95% level because alpha is 5%. So when we press compute, out comes our results window. And there at the bottom below our ANOVA table, we get our predicted value. So we're predicting to have uh, this, this number of bacteria. And we can get a prediction interval there on the end if we need it with an upper and a lower bound at the desired confidence level. That brings us to the end of this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, you know what to do. Otherwise, I will see you in class or the next video. Thanks for watching.